Hi everyone, CJ here. Welcome to the fifth episode of the Water Margin Summarized series. In the previous episode, we covered the origin story of the Tiger Slayer Wu Song, how he rose to become a hero by slaying a tiger barehanded, and his turn into an outlaw by his murderous vigilanteism. Now that the spotlight had returned to Song Jiang, the future leader of the 108 Outlaws, on this episode, we are going to cover his magnetic personality that attracted various recruits and the discovery of his greater destiny. For historical and cultural context, among other things, I will also talk about corruption in Song Dynasty and cannibalism in China. Before I start, let me remind you that we've got these cool shirts and merch for the series. These characters say, Within the four seas, all men are brothers a commonly used slogan in a novel. You can support what we are doing by getting these goods from the link below. Alternatively, you can also support us on Patreon or make one-off donation by using the Super Thanks button or coffee. After briefly celebrating their reunion, Song Jiang and Wu Song parted ways again because Wu Song's destination, Twin Dragon's Peak, was on a different direction to Song Jiang's destination. For the past few months, Song Jiang had been couch surfing, staying with his various friends. And this time, he's going to crash at his old pal Hua Rong's place. He was hoping that a general amnesty will eventually be announced and his crime of killing his mistress, Yan Po Si, will be pardoned. He didn't know when that day would come, but since he is so prodigious at making friends, he is not worried about running out of people to mooch from. One thing he is worried about though is his father, so he had sent his brother Song Qing home to check up on him. But he hasn't received any news from him yet. Hey yo, stick him up! Oh crud! What luck! While traversing the mountain path, Song Jiang was kidnapped by a short and ugly bandit captain named Wang Ying, the Stumpy Tiger. Song Jiang was then brought to his base to be presented to their leader, Yan Sun, and cohort Zheng Tian So. Oh, this fat cow's heart and liver will make great sweet and sour soup, Wang Ying laughed. Song Jiang, oh Song Jiang, I can't believe you will meet your end like this. Song Jiang called out his own name in despair. What did you say? Yan Sun asked. This is going to be a recurring theme in this novel. It seems that Song Jiang had somehow gained celebrity status for his philanthropy and the killing of his mistress. Almost everybody in Jiang Hu had heard about him by now. And whenever people hear his name, they will immediately stop whatever they are doing and befriend him. It is a bit silly in my opinion, since he really didn't do enough to deserve this kind of reputation. But it is a trope in Chinese fiction. So after the bandits released Song Jiang, they threw feasts in his honor for days and even released an innocent lady captured by Wang Ying for his sake. Song Jiang practically saved her from the defilement of this lecherous bandit. To make up for it, he promised that he would find him a wife one day. But Song Jiang didn't just rely on his reputation to gain friends and allies. There are also some dark arts that he will use to secure allegiances. And you will see them in action soon. After a week of carousing, Song Jiang finally made his way to the city to see his old friend Hua Rong, the master archer. He will be one of Song Jiang's most reliable general in his future campaigns. His presence in the city also came to the attention of the woman he saved. She turned out to be the governor's wife. But instead of being grateful to him, she wanted Song Jiang arrested because she saw that he was in league with the bandits who had captured her. Hua Rong was also a governor of the city but he was the military governor. Her husband, the civil governor, outranked him, so he could not prevent Song Jiang from being arrested. During the Song Dynasty, there was a strong emphasis on the civil over the military. That's why Hua Rong was overruled by his civil counterpart, even though they were both theoretically on the same rank. So he had no choice but to rescue Song Jiang and sought refuge with the bandits. Predictably, the governor sent out some generals to subdue the bandits. Huang Xing, followed by Qin Ming, they both lost the battle and Qin Ming was captured, despite him being a very talented general. Song Jiang and the rest really wanted him to join their side, so they treated him really well, throwing him plenty of feasts even. But obviously, that won't be enough to get this straight-laced military man to turn. 
And this is where Song Jiang's dark arts come in. A few days later, when they released Qingming to return to the city, he discovered that part of the city was destroyed. Apparently, the city was attacked and people were killed while he was away. And the culprit was disguised as him during the attack. So the governor executed Qingming's wife and was about to kill him too for the treachery. Qingming was framed. And with the governor's men charging at him, this poor general had no choice but to return to the bandit hideout and throw his lot with Song Jiang and the others. To smoothen the deal, Song Jiang acted as a matchmaker and offered Hua Rong's sister as replacement wife. She wasn't consulted for this decision, but it is just how patriarchal society functioned. With Qing Ming on their side, they flipped Huang Xing too, and together they conquered the city easily and executed the governor. However, they spared the occupants of the city and ordered them not to be harmed. As for the governor's wife, well, the lecherous Wang Ying wanted to keep her for his carnal entertainment. Denied! Yan Sun executed her. You know, this group of Hao Han is just full of contradiction and hypocrisy. They don't mind killing people to set Qing Ming up, but they spared the city after capturing it. So it is okay to be murderous cannibals, but you will never catch them sexually assaulting a woman on screen or disrespecting their parents. So in ancient Chinese Confucian society, the moral red line was drawn at how you treat your parents and you need to be sexually conservative. Interesting, huh? Anyway, now that they had created quite a ruckus, they needed to move before the government threw a larger army at them. So they decided to join the Mount Liang bandits. En route, they came across Lu Fang, a Lu Bu fanboy, and Guo Seng, the fictional ancestor of Guo Qing, the main character from the classic wuxia novel Legend of the Condor Heroes. They stopped their duel and joined the band the moment they heard Song Jiang's name mentioned. Unfortunately, Song Jiang was not fated to join the Liangshan bandits yet, because his brother, Song Qing, had sent a messenger, Si Yong, to inform him that his father had died and he needed to return home ASAP. Song Jiang was so distraught, he quickly wrote an introduction letter for his entourage and rushed home by himself. But it turned out to be a classic Asian parent trick. His father lied about his death because he missed Song Jiang too much, and Song Qing was in on it. Unfortunately, this little trick quickly turned into a disaster for Song Jiang. He was quickly spotted and captured by some officers. Luckily for him, his mistress's mother had died in the interim, and since there were no more plaintiff or witnesses, he got a relatively lighter sentence, which was further alleviated by him bribing the officials. Ironically, in Song Dynasty, the officials were compensated much better than in other dynasties. But corruption still occurred because it was tolerated by corrupt chancellors like Cai Jing, a historical figure blamed for the decline of Song Dynasty. Punishments were not properly enforced either because the emperor, Hui Zhong, was more of an artist than an administrator. In Water Margin, the practice of bribery was quite vividly described. When you want to bribe someone, you don't just pay the money to one person. You need to grease the hands of everyone related so that the other officials won't get jealous and rat you out. Obviously, you need to give more money to those who are higher ranked. When you are exiled, you need to bring money with you too so you can bribe your way into a comfortable life at your new destination. In most other books, bribery and corruption is usually looked down upon. But in Water Margin, you are practically provided with an instruction manual for bribery. Corruption back then had become a factor of life. The outlaws from Mount Liang could rescue him any time, obviously, but he declined their offer because at this point, he was still trying to serve his sentence out so that one day he could still return to society. Along his journey to his place of exile, he befriended quite a few interesting figures too, mostly pirates and street martial art performers, who he inadvertently ticked off but finally won over. I'm going to skip these filler chapters because they are not very important. Anyway, at his place of exile, he befriended Tai Zhong, the magic traveler, the chief warden who was also an old friend of Professor Wu Yong. Well, the novel had been quite down-to-earth and mundane so far, but this is actually the turning point where we're starting to get introduced to some magic. 
and the story is beginning to look a lot like an RPG adventure now. Taizong could tie up some Taoist talismans around his ankles and travel really fast, 500 li a day, making him an invaluable member of the team. Song Jiang also met Li Kui, a warden who will become his most loyal pit bull, a murderous, bloodthirsty, cannibalistic pit bull. He will play a very important narrative role as Song Jiang's foil, but we will talk about this later. Song Jiang was supposed to be serving his sentence at Jiangzhou, but since he bribed and befriended all the wardens, his sentence felt a lot like a holiday, and he could visit various inns to enjoy local delicacies and wine. One day, when he was drunk, he wrote a poem about his great potential and he was just biding his time to rise. If he succeeds, he can laugh at Huang Cao's feeble attempt. Huang Cao was the rebel whose rebellion led to the collapse of the Tang Dynasty. I have covered Huang Cao in one of my previous videos. If you know anything about Huang Cao, then this is a very clear foreshadowing of Sung Jiang's ambition and the plot direction of this novel. So I'm not going to spoil it now, but you can watch the video if you want to get some clues. Predictably, this poem got him into trouble because Huang Wenbing, the governor's assistant, saw it as a seditious declaration. So to escape persecution, Song Jiang did the whole pretending to be insane stick by covering himself with feces. Yeah, it is a trope in Chinese stories. Character pretending to be crazy will try to prove their insanity by eating and playing with poop. The historical precedence for this was set by King Gou Jin in the 5th century BCE. I have a video about him too. Sadly, this trick did not work on Huang Wenbing. He was just too sharp and saw through the ruse. He ordered Song Jiang to be beaten until he confessed. The beating was so severe, Song Jiang eventually broke character and admitted his crime. Torture was a legitimate method to extract information back then. Tai Zong was then instructed to deliver a letter to the governor's father, Chancellor Chai Jing, requesting further instruction on how to deal with this rebel. Along the way, Tai Zong was intercepted by Zhu Kui, a Mount Liang outlaw, and all the outlaws were alarmed by Song Jiang's predicament. Cao Kai, with his predilection for heists, recruited Xiao Rang, a master calligrapher who forged him a letter, and Jing Da Jin, master carver, to fake the official stamp. Their family members were brought to the mountain to be, quotation marks, secured in case the authorities were to harass them for assisting the outlaws. But it is really a failed threat. The forged letter ordered Song Jiang to be transferred to the capital so he could be intercepted and saved en route. However, there was a fatal flaw with the letter. And by the time they realized it, Tai Zong was already gone. The biggest problem here was that the forged letter was signed off with Tai Jing's own name. But obviously, a father won't sign off a letter to his own son with his own name. And sure enough, Huang Wenbing detected the flaw and both Song Chang and Tai Zong was put on the chopping block. They will be executed in public, ASAP, before the outlaws could carry out whatever conspiracy they are planning. The execution drew a crowd. Obviously, a lot of people wanted to see the execution of a celebrity like Song Chang, and this sea of people makes for a convenient cover for a clandestine group of conspirators. The moment the order was cried out, a whirlwind of a man struck the guards. Li Kui, the black whirlwind, chopped them into pieces with his twin axes. Then, a torrent of swords and spears followed, as the captains of Liangshan outlaws threw away their disguises and came to Song Jiang's rescue. They were assisted by Song Jiang's new friends too. Together, these Hao Hans carved out a bloodied escape route and spirited their friend to safety. Now it is payback time! Once they regrouped, they raised their bandit army to crush the city. Next, they turned their attention to the little town where Huang Wenbing lived. With the assistance of Ho Jin, Huang family's servant, they were able to find the credences' house. Apparently, Huang Wenbing's brother was a nice guy, so they let him live. But they massacred the rest of Huang Wenbing's family and captured him for torture. Li Kui was given the honor to do the gruesome deed. So he sliced the scoundrel bit by bit, cooked the pieces, and ate him, before finally making a soup out of his heart and liver as hangover cure for everyone. There are plenty of stories of cannibalism in China, and they fall mostly into two categories, 
One is hunger, which is often encountered in war and famine, and the other one is humiliation. That is a Chinese expression, wanting to peel off your enemy's skin and eat their flesh. It means that you hate someone so much, you want to do the worst things possible to him. Another form of humiliation is to gouge out somebody's heart and liver. This way, the victim will die in the most culturally gruesome way. You will often see this phrase written in literature, and it is very prevalent in this novel. Cooking someone is another method of dealing a humiliating death, and it is even more cruel to feed their cooked flesh to their family member. This death by cooking had historically been used by the last king of Sang Dynasty to humiliate his duke, and it led to an uprising that eventually overthrew the dynasty and established the Zhou Dynasty. The first emperor of Han Dynasty, Liu Bang, was also threatened by his rival Xiang Yu that he would cook his father unless he surrendered. But the rascal managed to bluff his way out of it. So the combination of these three practices means that you are doing the most humiliating thing to someone. In ancient narratives and fiction, this kind of death is usually reserved for tyrants and the worst corrupt officials. Nobody actually eats human meat because they like the taste. Except for maybe Li Kui, but he is kind of special. He is written to be THE monster, the forthright, cruel, and murderous foil to Song Jiang's righteous hypocrisy. He is the yin to Song Jiang's yang. But he is not just an abstract literary character. When it comes to running violent organizations, you will see characters like him quite often in Triad and Yakuza stories. The mad dog, the enforcer that will commit all the violence for the boss, while keeping the boss clean enough to do the negotiations. At the same time, characters like Li Kui serves as a narrative time bomb, the wild card that will throw an axe into Sung Chang's plan time and again. Ironically, it is often to their advantage. It is really difficult to get rid of this kind of follower because he is just too violently loyal to you, so you will have to weigh his usefulness to the liability he will bring. This duality is further accentuated by the following chapters when they went to pick up their parents to bring them to the safety of Mount Liang. As the company grow, they attracted volunteers who wanted to join them, but Song Chang still couldn't officially join the outlaws yet. He had to do just one more thing. He had to bring his father with him to the mountain for safety. And when he returned home, he was chased around by soldiers again. When he found refuge at the temple, the mystic goddess of the Nine Heavens revealed herself to him and told him about his destiny as the leader of the 108 stars. His duty was to defend the country and eradicate evil, and he was given three magical books that will assist him. Because evil still exists in his own heart, he could not return to heaven yet. And even she could not save him if he committed more sins. After Song Chang's outlaw friends rescued him and his father, Song Chang then officially joined the outlaws. When Li Kui goes home to pick up his mother, he had to be chaperoned by Zhu Kui, who was ordered to keep him out of trouble. Well, since Zhu Kui wanted to see his brother Zhu Fu in the nearby town anyway, that's all fine by him. While Zhu Kui was catching up with his brother, Li Kui continued the rest of his journey by himself. Along the way, Li Kui met an imposter who stole his identity and robbed people under his name. He defeated the imposter easily, but spared him because the imposter lied about having an old mother that he had to take care of. Later on, however, when Li Kui paid a local woman to make him food, she turned out to be the imposter's wife. By chance, he overheard the plot to kill him, so he took the initiative to kill the imposter first. Since the woman who got away had cooked a lot of rice, and there is no meat around, Li Kui barbecued the imposter's flesh and ate it as side dish. Yep, that's gruesome, but the wheel of karma will turn on Li Kui soon. Because everyone in the village hates Li Kui, including his own brother, Li Kui had to run away with his mother on his back. Sadly, while he was away looking for water to quench her thirst, a pack of tiger had devoured her. This is his retribution for eating so many people. The raging Li Kui cut the four beasts down with his axe. Ironically, this turned Li Kui into a local hero, until he was arrested again when the imposter's wife accused him of murdering her husband. He was eventually rescued by Zhu Kui and his brother Zhu Fu. 
the guard captain who was ordered to transfer him, Li Ying, was also recruited because he was a friend of Zhu Fu. He would get into trouble if he were to return after failing to transfer the prisoner. Without his mother, the only anchor Li Kui had was Song Jiang. Now the two of them are virtually connected at the waist. Thus, these two personalities came to represent the yin and yang of the Liangshan bandits. On the next episode, the outlaws go to war under Song Jiang's leadership. Additionally, I will also cover superstition and magic in Song Dynasty. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss it. And don't forget, we've got great t-shirt and merch you can get to support the channel. Before I go, I would like to thank our patrons at Patreon and other contributors for making this series possible. Until next time, stay cool my bros!